Martin Luther King, one of the great Americans of our time, was assassinated in 1968. Most Americans are not that certain about what actually occurred on that day. Who pulled the trigger and why, would, why did it happen? What are the details of that event? Today we're going to discuss that with our guest. Let me introduce you to Jim DiEugenio. Hi, Ken. Hi. You're a, an author and a political analyst and commentator. Yes. Yes. What was the book you published? Well, in 1993 I published Destiny Betrayed, which is primarily about the assassination of President Kennedy. And then, uh, 10 years later in 2003, uh, I co-edited a book called The Assassinations, which is about all four assassinations of the 1960s. That would be John F. Kennedy, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and Senator Robert Kennedy. Okay. So today we're going to talk about the actual events that occurred in the assassination of Martin Luther King. Correct. Okay. Now, most Americans, or uh, my friends, are familiar with that last visible, that last image of Martin Luther King standing on the balcony of the motel he was staying at. Was it, was, what's the name of it? It's called the Lorraine Motel. The Lorraine Motel. And he's on the back, in the balcony in the back, facing the alley, walking around, you know, talking, or getting ready for the day, sort of like, you know. And that's, that's the image we have. Mm -hmm. What was going on at that exact time well, that he was walking around there? Something that very few people know is he wasn't even supposed to be in that room. Okay, a week before he arrived there, somebody switched to rooms. All right. He was supposed to be on a lower floor, first floor, facing inside to the courtyard. All right. Somebody went in there and changed the room location so he'd be upstairs on the second floor with a balcony that he could walk out on. Now, of course, what makes that so interesting is that if he would have had the original room, he could have never been killed like that. All right. Because you couldn't have got the open shot at him, you know, from across the street. All right. So actually, it's about six o'clock at night and he's getting ready to go to a dinner and he walks outside. All right. And in a flash, there's one bullet. OK, that goes ahead, you know, and, and basically, you know, kills him almost instantly. All right. Now, what makes this so interesting, of course, is that they can't find the killer. <laughs> uh, the accused killer, James Earl Ray, flees, first of all, to the southern part of the country. All right. Wait, wait, wait. This, the Lorraine Motel is in just for... Memphis, the, Tennessee. Memphis, Tennessee. So he's in right. the south. What do you mean he, he flees? He goes all the way down to Georgia. Okay. All right. He goes all the way down to the southern quadrant. All right. Then he goes all the way up, back up to the northern part of the United States, passes over into Toronto, okay, all right, and goes ahead, gets phony IDs, and these phony IDs and this money, okay, goes ahead and gets them across the Atlantic Ocean, where he finally lands in London. He goes to Lisbon, Portugal <laughs> for a week, finally goes back to London, and he's finally apprehended. This is like a month, all right, of this, of this FBI chase with a supposedly the biggest manhunt in history, and they can't find this one guy whose biggest his biggest criminal heist before was worth about 1500 bucks, all right? So when he comes back, when James Earl Ray is abducted at Heathrow Airport in London, all right, and he comes back, um, they appoint him an attorney, okay? All right, Arthur Haynes. Arthur Haynes is actually preparing the case, all right? And he actually has a pretty good case that he thinks that he can present in court. Suddenly, a big-time lawyer, a guy named Percy Foreman, very high profile, comes in from Texas, all right, and he manages to shove Haynes, who's a local lawyer, out of the picture. He promises James O. Ray the sun, the moon, and the sky, all right, uh, and so James O. Ray switches lawyers. Worst mistake of the guy's life. Percy Foreman ends up basically selling him out, okay, uh, brings in um, an author to do a book, signs a book contract, all right? And what basically happens is he pleads him guilty, and he actually forces him to plead guilty. Right? I, you know, I got to interrupt you because, you know, these are just spontaneous conversations here. So I'm going to ask you a question. I don't know if you know or not. 
Where did James Earl Ray get the money to do all of this traveling? Well, see, where, where, where's the bankroll? I mean, to go right. into London, he's flying around the world. Not until afterwards did he actually get to tell his story. All right. He had a mysterious handler by the name of Raoul. Okay, and he met Raoul up in Canada, and Raoul basically said, "Look, I do gun deals, etc." All right, and I need a messenger. I need a foot guy, all right, to go ahead and deliver things to certain places at certain times, okay, while I'm up here. And so he said, I, you, I'll pay you well. I'll be all cash transactions, all right, et cetera. All right, and so this is what happens to James O'Reilly. He goes on like this for a, a year and I think four months with Raul, all right. And so Raul goes ahead and maneuvers him even to, into buying the gun that's supposed to be the gun that killed King. Oh, so this is before the assassination. Right, this is about a year and four months he's associated so he, he, with Rule. As a handler, he right. moved him around. Right. He set him up. Right. He's a patsy. Correct. Correct, yeah. He even got him to buy the gun, okay, that, that was supposed to be used in the, in, in the actual assassination. So, and he, and the other question, which I think you were alluding to, how did he get the, the phony IDs to go under these aliases? Yeah. Because if you take a look at the four aliases he used, and this is something that nobody's been able to figure out. Number one, they all resemble Ray. If you look at a picture, I think it's in Phil Melanson's book. He has all four pictures arranged, and it's amazing. They all resemble Ray. Okay, number two, they're all from Toronto. I believe it's the Canadian city of Toronto. And they all live within a 10-mile radius of each other. Now, what are the odds of that? What are the odds of that happening? Okay? And the answer is it's almost none. How could you possibly do that unless you had, you know, some kind of computer that you could go ahead and match, you know, the, the faces, you know, with... Or a big staff. Yeah. I mean, you, you couldn't do that. You it's a project. Just, what are the odds of picking them out of the phone book? That you... The right. four people that resemble you that all live in the same <laughs> You know, it's just re very hard to believe. You know, so this is what he uses to get away from the authorities when he flees, when he, uh, you know, f flees to London. Now, once he goes ahead and he's apprehended and he stands trial, all right, I said Percy Foreman comes in and basically sells him down the river, all right? And about, I think it's, 24 to 48 hours after he, he has his mini trial where they recite the evidence against him. And Foreman didn't object to anything. The only guy who said anything was Ray. All right, when the judge said, you know, do you want to say anything? He says, well, yes, I would. And he goes, well, what is it? He goes, well, I just want to get it on the record that I do not agree with the theories of Mr. Hoover or Mr. Clark. And he says, who's Mr. Clark? Ramsey Clark, the attorney general. I just want to make it clear I don't believe what their theories are saying. All right, and that's the only thing that he says on his behalf during the entire mini trial. It was really no trial at all because Foreman didn't put on, didn't no do anything. defense. Yeah, he didn't say anything. All right, during the whole thing. All right, and so about forty-eight hours after the trial, Ray realizes what happens to him, and he writes a letter to the judge saying, "I would like to reconsider everything that just happened. I don't think I was represented well." And in a very, very puzzling happenstance that could only happen in the movies, the judge, Preston Battle, is actually reading his plea on his desk, and he's about to go ahead and sign it, and he had a heart attack and died. Oh, come on. <laughs> come on. <laughs> I said it's out of a movie, all right? So the, that, there went the last best chance. You know, for, you know, for... I mean, he just <laughs> collapsed? <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, it was right on his desk when they found his body. All right? Oh, oh you mean in his private office, not yeah. in front... Not a, not yeah, in his private office. Well, so they said it was a heart attack. Well, well There was nobody really in the died. room with him. No. Nobody really knows he what He apparently happened, died from a heart that, that, attack. That's what happened. All right? And so James O'Ray wasn't allowed. Now, let me tell you something else. In that kind of a situation, all right, when you're in the process of, of reapplying, you know, for a rehearing, et cetera, and yeah. something happens and 
you're supposed to be able to refile it later. Well, what they did is when James O. Ray finally got a good lawyer, William Pepper, all right, the Tennessee legislature changed the law. So he couldn't get a new trial. All right, that's how determined they were. Yeah, but if they change the law, it doesn't go retroactively. Yeah, they made it retroactively. Okay, they couldn't do it. All right, that, that's how shades they of Shades of our current administration. Yeah, right. So We didn't break the law, we changed it. Right. <laughs> so, so what happens is he doesn't get to use that part of the law to go ahead and get a new trial. Now, what happens later is that years down the line, James Earl Ray finally gets an attorney who's willing to take his case for nothing and go ahead and argue and try to get him a new trial. And this guy's name is Bill Pepper. You know, who's well, William Pepper, William who, Pepper right. he, has a, he has his own history. He's a notable personage right. at the time. Right. He's an American who moved to England, all right, and he did a lot of really good things with King when he was alive. All right. it, was, it was supposed to be Pepper who actually got King interested in the Vietnam War when he did this article for Ramparts magazine. Called Could you say that again? It was supposed to be Pepper who... Pepper who actually got King very interested in the Vietnam War. Oh, oh, oh. All oh, right, I because see. He did this article for Ramparts called The Children of Vietnam, in which he went there and he sh all these pictures of what the napalm and everything was doing to these kids. And it was w and went into Ramparts and King saw it, got very interested, and they met, etc. And then this led to and the famous speech friendship. by King at right. the uh, Riverside. Right, in New York, yeah. So Pepper comes back from England, decides to take the case, and he reads all the stuff in the law books, and he finds this one section that says if a new technology has developed after the verdict has come through then the defendant even if he's convicted can apply for a new evidentiary hearing now this is state law that's a state law in Tennessee so he found this way to get a new evidentiary hearing all right and he was going to go ahead and these 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 new kind of because the rifle was never tested so now I, they you can, know, I was going to come back and ask about the ballistics. Right. The rifle was never tested. So now they can test the rifle, okay, to see if the, if the bullet that supposedly killed King matches, okay? Well, but they, but they know the caliber. In other words, Ray is associated with a rifle right. that he purchased. Right. And they found it. Right. And now it's a question of, did the bullet come from that rifle? But the caliber of the bullet they discovered in King was the same as the rifle. Well... Yes and no. They say it's the same caliber, but a funny thing happened to that bullet. Once it went to the FBI, it got cut up in pieces. Oh. <laughs> and nobody has ever been able to explain why it was cut up in pieces after it was extracted from the body. Okay. All right. But, but once it's cut up, how could they possibly... Well, new that, technology? that's what made it difficult. So they yeah. had to examine the, the reports that the FBI supposedly filed when they did their original test. Oh. Okay, so everybody thinks that this is going to go nowhere, but what they didn't bargain on was the judge, all right? The judge is a guy named Judge Joe Brown, all right, who happens to be African-American, born in Los Angeles, went to UCLA Law School in the 60s, etc., and so he has a real feeling for what happened to Dr. King, all right? It lands in his court, all right? And so the local DA and everybody is thinking, well, he's, he's not really going to take this seriously, is he? Well, he actually did take it seriously. Every once in a while, you get a good apple. Yeah, yeah, You know, yeah. okay, yeah. well, this guy happened to be a good apple. Uh -huh. So he goes ahead, and he allows Pepper to come into court, all right, and go ahead and start applying for these rifle tests that are going to be done. All right. So this is a, a, an evidentiary hearing. It's right. not, an, it's not an, a, no. a, an appeal or trial. No. Not Just yet. an evidentiary hearing. It's an evidentiary hearing. hearing to see if he can pass that threshold. To if he can pass that threshold, then you go ahead. All right. All right. Well, believe me, they were determined that this threshold was never going to be passed. So they did a first round of rifle tests, and they came back inconclusive. This was the problem. There was a mark on the test bullets, all right, that was not on the original bullet. But the prosecution said, the, D, the DA, well, that probably came from the barrel of the rifle because it hasn't been cleaned, all right? So Joey Brown, who's a rifleman, shoots every weekend. He goes, well, that's easy to solve. We can get just go to the rifle shop. You get this liquid. 
you go ahead and pump it through the rifle barrel and it doesn't mark any of the inside of the rifle barrel and it cleans it all out and then we'll do the test. Well, when the DA heard this, that this is what he was gonna do and we'll see if it comes from the rifle or if it comes from the fouling of the rifle. When he heard that all of a sudden, all hell broke loose in Memphis, okay? When they heard that this guy was gonna do this and I'm not kidding. You know, the press comes in, you know, that Washington comes in, the FBI comes in, the, the local authorities, Joe Brown made a big mistake, he went on vacation. Well, the local authorities broke into his office and they accused them of, of misusing the files, okay? Yeah. And so they, what they do is like all the time, they ginny up these phony accusations, yeah. okay, of, of, of malpractice, of jurisprudence, you know, he's, he's crossing the line, et cetera. And suddenly, Joe Brown was off the case. Yeah, and I was. I was just going to say, based on what happened to the other judge, he better get some good medical insurance. <laughs> Joe Brown was off the case, and they got him a job on this TV show that he does now, the Judge Joe Brown Show. He lives in uh, West LA. I actually went to meet him at his condominium one, once. All right, and uh, so then, basically, essentially, the rehearing for Ray was. Gone. So, so, they, but the, so now Joe Brown, his last thing before he we went on vacation was clean the barrel and, and redo the test. We're going to redo the test. And, and it never got done. It never got done. It never happened because of all this, the controversy that C broke Can we out. go back a second because sure. I was going to ask you about the ballistics. But Ray, there was evidence that Ray, here's the Lorraine Motel, King's on the Balcony. Across the alley is this tavern Bessie's. or inn. There's, there's Bessie's boarding house and then there's this deli, you know, right next to it. And okay. King was in one of those? No, no. King was a I'm, I'm sorry. James Earl Ray. Was, was in Bessie's boarding house. So it, right. he logged, he registered, he was there, he didn't... Under deny. a false name. Under a false name. Now, to say that this Bessie's boarding house was low class is being mean to Motel 6. Okay. It's, it's really a kind of bum of the month club. Uh -huh. Now, if you had been planning to kill this great civil rights, this civil rights leader who's right across the way from you, would you go into a place like that with a suit and tie? No, no, no. You don't want to be. You, you, <laughs> you want don't to want to draw in. attention to yourself, right? right. Well, James O'Ray, if you believe this, went in there under a phony name, and he was wearing a suit and a white shirt and a tie uh -huh. at a place like this. Right. Okay? So he would stand out, right? Because he was sent in and said, yeah. you know, put a carnation in so that the <laughs> bellhop remembers it. Right. Okay. And so now you have to believe that the place that he chose to kill King was a public restroom because they didn't have restrooms in the actual rooms. Yeah. It was a communal, a public restroom. Now- That's where he supposedly fired from. Right. On top of a bathtub to get through the window, if, and there's been pictures taken of French magazine. They actually sent a guy in there to see if they could go ahead and, and take the shot that was supposed to kill King. They had to have the guy, and I've seen the picture, you would have to be a gymnast, you know, to contort yourself in the position to go ahead and fire through the top of that window, you know, and, and kill King. Now, on top of that, of course, if you're in a public restroom, you don't know who's waiting outside. Somebody could be waiting outside, you know, and sees you, you know, run right out with the, you happen to have a rifle in your hand, et cetera. But this is a story we have to believe, to believe that, that Ray did this and the capper to this story is that supposedly after King is shot, Ray goes into his room, grabs all his things, stuffs them into a briefcase, runs down the stairs, okay, jumps into his car, but before he jumps into the car, he drops the briefcase and leaves it in front of this five and dime store called Kniep's including all this incriminating stuff about, you know, the camera, okay, the beer can with his fingerprints on it, et cetera, all this other stuff that he bought. You know, as Mark Lane said, you know, if James O'Ray did that, he should be not guilty by reason of insanity, all right, for, you know, to go ahead and do that. Now, it came out later at the civil trial, which Pepper managed to push on towards after he couldn't get the evidentiary hearing with Judge Joe Brown. He had a civil trial against a guy named Lloyd, Lloyd Jowers, who had that tavern that we were talking about next to Bessie's uh, boarding house. All right. 
it came out that the guy who owned that five and dime store where they found the suitcase he told his son that that case was there 10 minutes before the shooting yeah all right so you know, somebody's was, very well organized it, it was a setup job you know from yeah, but, the start. but just just as a, a question that comes up that james earl ray have a history as a marksman no but this because this was an excellent shot it was a, it was a really good shot yeah it was really in fact it makes it even more amazing, as Judge Joe Brown testified at the civil trial. Um, that rifle was not bore sighted. And he said it couldn't have been because when he checked out the shop where James O'Ray purchased it at, they did not have the machine to bore sight the rifle. Which means? Which means... What's bore sighting? I mean? It means that rifle has to be sighted in with the machine. You can't do it manually. Uh huh. Okay. You can't do it, you know, like this, you know, and then and then adjust the thing here. This, you know, you have to do it with a machine that yeah. they have to have at the rifle shop. And Joe Brown said, if you've ever had any experience with that kind of rifle, if it's not bore sighted, you're going to miss by 20 feet the first shot. Okay. You know. And so you know anybody and, and anybody who has any experience with rifles will will tell you that. So after Joe Brown got taken off the case as a civil trial. Lloyd Jower said, Pepper went ahead and pushed for his own, the delicatessen uh, next to the boarding house, uh, had let it leak out that he had been part of the conspiracy. All right? Who, and get, when? What, what do you mean? Lloyd leak? Jowers went on TV in the 1980s. This is when Pepper was making all this noise about getting a new trial, all right, uh, in Memphis. And he went ahead and said, that he had been part of the conspiracy, that he had actually given the real marksman the right. But, but this isn't let it leak out. He made the statement. Yeah, he made the statement publicly. On public television. Right. This is a public declaration. Right. right. And then now it's too late to cover that up because right. it's on the air. Right. So, so did anybody contest this? Did anybody react and say? Well, no. What was so surprising is that the, the DAs didn't do anything. The they no, just went ho-hum past they, the yeah, keys. Yeah, basically so... Happens every day. <laughs> we, we get a confession in one of these big assassination cases. Go to sleep. All right. So nobody did anything. So he yeah. admitted that he was part of a conspiracy. Right. Did he name at any time? Did he name this who is was called conspiracy? This is what he said. He said, I was called, okay, and I was supposed to do a job for $100,000. I was supposed to give the real marksman the actual rifle, and then I was supposed to dispose of the rifle afterwards. And all I'll say is the guy I gave the rifle to was not James O'Reilly. So he yeah. admitted. Yeah. Right. That's what he said. And he didn't d d do details about the, the description of the guy, what kind of rifle or anything, no. but he did. He admitted this. Right. On public now, television. Now, after the thing, his story went a little because he wasn't prosecuted. His story began to change and waver. First he said it was one guy. Then he said it was Raul. Well, okay. Because nobody came after him, okay? You know, if you're actually charged, you don't change your story. But he was allowed to hang out there, and so his story began to waver and change. Pepper went ahead and went ahead and charged a civil trial in the family of Martin Luther King. You know, his, his wife, Coretta Scott King, sons and daughters, decided to file a civil case against Jowers. Very, very, very historical case. Yeah. Right. No, I, there was a book on it. I read the book. Well, what ha what's really funny about this is that this is really a big thing, right? The only magazine that had a reporter there every day was Probe, our magazine, our little magazine. And yeah. he ended up, of course, he ended up winning the case, and he presented a lot of evidence in there, a lot of evidence in the record, you know, for there actually being a conspiracy, Pepper did. And so, so that's, and that is the biggest... I mean, it, it, you know, I, when I read the book, when I'm listening to you now, it's obvious. It's it's plain as anything, right? Yes. So there's, there's nothing happens about this. No, stuff. and in fact, uh, it made page 16 of the New York Times when the, uh, <laughs> when, the when the verdict came down. All right, I'll, I'll never forget. Uh, one of our subscribers called me and said, Jim, it was on page 16 of the New York Times, and what was on page one was a new diet for Chinese people. 
Okay, how they're getting people to lose weight in China. That was on the front page. But the conspiracy to kill Martin Luther King was on page 16. Okay, J yeah. Jim, we're out of time. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> There's more to tell. There's a lot more to tell. Okay, thank you very much for wa watching. Don't get disheartened. This kind of thing goes on all the time, and you have to, you know, uh, have good hearts, stout hearts, put up, keep fighting. Thanks for watching.